guys for about 21 years now, and um, I guess the main thing that I, the reason I do this is um, I'm trying to teach the lessons of the Holocaust. I think in America we're learning a lot about the Holocaust, but I'm not sure we're learning from it. And so uh, I believe there's a lesson for all human beings in what happened in the Holocaust that could, could and actually has happened again. And so I use the Holocaust history to challenge Americans to look at the presence of racism, hatred, prejudice, and intolerance in their communities, in their schools, in their families, and in their individual hearts. Because I think there's many, many lessons to be learned, a warning to the future from the Holocaust, what happened in Germany. And that's my motivation in, uh, in doing this message. Once in a while I run into somebody, you know, you meet somebody, and they say, what do you do? I say, I'm a lawyer, a German teacher. If you got more time to talk, I'll tell them about this thing. And they'll often say to me, just a minute, did you, did you say Holocaust? I said, yeah. Well, why? What's your connection to that? They'll say, you're not Jewish, are you? You didn't lose any family in that story, did you? What, what's... And then they'll often say something like this. You know, when is enough enough? Haven't we had enough books written? Full-length Hollywood feature films made, documentaries produced, speeches given, testimony given, trials held of alleged perpetrators, um, memorials set up, foundations established, and all that Holocaust stuff. My God, when is the time to shut up and quit whining about the past and move on? Well, obviously, I don't believe this is lame history, nor do I think it ever shall be. Nor do I think we've done enough with this, nor do I think we should shut up and quit whining and move on. Because obviously, if I did believe any of that, I wouldn't be here with you today. I'd be back in Hammond practicing law and getting ready for my German classes this afternoon. So obviously, I think there's something real important that's for you and me as Americans, and especially for you, the eighth grade class, this time, in this place in history, Spooner Middle School, Spooner, Wisconsin. That's, that's why I get you here in part two this afternoon. Why must we never, ever forget here? I'm just going to give you a quick timeline with some dates. This is just part of my intro. Stay with me. When we talk about the Holocaust, we're talking about a 12-year period of history, from 1933 to 1945. Major dates within that 12 years, January 33, Adolf Hitler is named Chancellor of Germany. The Nazi Party comes to power in Germany. Six and a half years later, June of, I'm sorry, September of 1939, <coughs> Germany invades Poland. World War II begins. Germany attacks Poland. A year and a half after that, in June of 1941, Germany invades the Soviet Union. The war expands greatly into the east. Six months after that, in December of 1941, the United States gets attacked at Pearl Harbor in Hawaii by the Japanese. We're at war with Japan. Within a week or so of Pearl Harbor, Germany and Italy declared war on the United States. Why? Because they had a treaty with Japan. They were allies. So the United States got pulled into World War II right at the end of 1941. Three years and a few months later, in May of 1945, you have the collapse of the Third Reich in Berlin. Germany surrenders, the war in Europe comes to an end. Three months later, the atom bombs are dropped in Hiroshima, Nagasaki, Japan. In August of 45, Japan surrenders a short time after the second bomb was dropped, and World War II comes to an end. Twelve years, 33 to 45, during which another event took place that we now call the Holocaust. Now, before we go any further in my intro, I want to separate those 7 to 10 million into two groups. Over here, I put these groups. Jews, gypsies, homosexuals, disabled individuals, and Jehovah Witnesses. If you're one of these groups over here, one of these, it did not matter how well you could make the Nazi salute. It didn't matter that you could say, Sig Heil, or Heil Hitler, with perfect German, not even a trace of a foreign accent. It didn't matter how many of their medals you won, how sharp you looked in one of their uniforms, how hard you tried to succeed in their little system. They hunted you, and once they found out you're one of these, no matter how often you did this, no matter how perfect you shouted, Sig Heil, it all meant nothing. The uniform was torn off, you were hauled away to a death camp, and literally millions of you lost your lives. Over here, let's put these groups. Catholics, Protestants, priests, ministers, communist, socialists, social democrats, trade union leaders, teachers, professors, government leaders, all these groups over here, as long as you did this when they told you to, as long as you said hi to Hitler when the rules said you should, but much more importantly over here, as long as you kept your mouth shut when you knew you better. Don't tell me where those cattle cars crammed full of people are going that I see almost every morning on my way to work. I really don't want to know, and I'm not going to ask. 
Just make sure I keep getting my paycheck. Don't mess with me or my stuff. Let me go on holiday a couple times a year, and I'll play your little game. And I'll pretend I don't see those cattle cars. Because sadly, I don't think it affects me. Sadly, literally, millions chose to play this game over here. They chose to effectively remain bystanders. One of the greatest crimes ever carried out against human beings went on in their own nation, perpetrated by a government they put in power. They played it cool over here, they played it safe, and they got by. What I'm suggesting to you is to become a target over here, you had to do something. You had to act. And as the war turned against Germany, things got more extreme. Children, members of the Hitler Youth, children, reported on their parents. I heard my father say this about Adolf Hitler last night at supper. Two days later, the Gestapo could show up at the door and take the father away, perhaps never to be seen again. Things got more extreme. It didn't take much near the end. Maybe one day you were tired of seeing those cattle cars. Maybe one day you went to the authorities and you said, what's going on here? What are you doing with those people? Where are you taking them? A year ago you took my neighbors. I've known those people for 25 years. They were good people. Like me, they were German citizens. Unlike me, they happened to be Jewish. A month after you took them, you auctioned off all their possessions in the market square. Two months later, another family took over their house. They're still living there today. You're obviously not planning on them ever coming back. What have you done with them? I demand to know. Only when you stepped out like that over here and did something did you risk becoming a target. As long as you kept your mouth shut and played it cool, you got by. As I said, sadly, millions played it cool. What I'm saying is over here, you were targeted because of something you did. Over there, it didn't matter what you did. You were targeted because of what you were. Anybody know the generic meaning of the word Holocaust here? The older meaning of the word? Yeah? Uh, they fire? Yeah, that's it. In the Bible, Holocaust refers to a burnt offering, like a sacrificial offering to God, usually offering an animal sacrifice. But it's always said the Holocaust refers to a fire, but he, said, he, didn't say, he didn't just say fire, he said big fire. Um, you wouldn't call a campfire a bonfire, even a raging house or barn fire a Holocaust. An answer I've gotten a few times over the years that I really like, a firestorm. What is a firestorm? It's a big fire. It's a dangerous fire. Uh, professional firefighters that go out west every year in this nation to fight those fires, they fear the development of a firestorm the most. Why? Because a true firestorm can travel hundreds of meters and change directions in seconds. They're deadly. I, you snuck back in and you listened. They didn't know you were there. What kind of stuff did you overhear your mother whisper about in 1935 It's hearing her voice? You heard her telling her husband, your father, and her parents, your grandparents, about some stuff happening in a country not all that far away from you, a country you've learned about in school already, a country called Germany. And it wasn't just stuff happening. It was a personal element to it. It was stuff happening to people like you, meaning Jewish people. What kind of stuff did you overhear your, you remember overhearing your mother whispering about? One of the first things you remember is she was whispering about things being painted on the sides of buildings and synagogues throughout that nation of Germany, hate-filled anti-Jewish graffiti. A short time later, you overheard a whisper about German soldiers standing in front of the narrow doorways of certain shops all day long with their arms like this. And any time a customer wanted to get into one of those shops, they had to shove their way past one or more of those soldiers, and more often than not, they were shoved back, and then often they were beaten, assaulted, and attacked, and prevented from going into the shop. And why did they hold their arms like this? You overheard your mother whisper? Well, for two reasons. Number one, to block the narrow doorway so the customers couldn't get in. But number two, to hold crudely lettered signs that said things in German such as Deutsche wird euch kauft nicht bei Juden. Germans, defend yourselves. Don't buy from Jews. A short time later, you overheard your mother whispering about driving into certain German cities now. And under the name of the city sign, out on the highway of the Autobahn, tubing in, perhaps, like out here, Spooner, on the same signpost, many cities and villages have now put up a new sign that proclaimed in one sentence that ended in an exclamation point, Diese Stadt ist Judenheim. <coughs> this city is free of Jews. And we're obviously very proud of that fact because we're announcing it to you as we welcome into our city from the highway of the Autobahn, or perhaps in Oberammergau sind Juden unerwünscht. In Oberammergau, Jews are not desired. Get out. Get back on the train, get back in your car, go back to wherever you came from, you're not wanted here. Can we make it any more obvious to you? Another November night, just about one week before, throughout that nation of Germany, hundreds of thousands, perhaps even millions of Germans, 
gathered for rallies in the Marktplätze, the market squares all over that nation, biggest cities, smallest villages. Many Germans came to these rallies dressed in their finest Nazi uniforms. Every campaign ribbon was in place. For other Germans, it was enough to wear that red, white, and black Nazi swastika armband over their suit or overcoat to prove their loyal party affiliation. Many Germans proudly carried Nazi flags at these rallies. Some had those banners with the swastika surrounded by the words Deutschland erwache, Germany awake. Some held torches. Speeches were given at these rallies. Hatred was spoken. Brass bands played in the larger cities. In some cities, many cities, they burned books. And this is almost on cue, your mother continued. Suddenly, all those rallies started marching. They all left the squares. And where did they go, she said? They all went to the same places, to the synagogues where Jewish people gathered. And they circled those synagogues with their torches, their flags, and their banners. They went around and around and around. And within about three or four minutes of the circling having started, your mother said, in every village or city, one of those soldiers present suddenly shouted, Halt! Halt! And the circling stopped, and the crowds faced the synagogue, and the jeering and the chanting started up again. He took that heavy stone he had just dug up out of the earth, he let out a very loud shout, and then he ran down that pathway that had just been cleared for him, and he took that heavy stone, and he pitched it through the night sky, and he threw it at the synagogue. He aimed for a window. As you might imagine, the windows and synagogues in a nation as old as Germany, most of those windows were priceless, irreplaceable, in some cases centuries old, stained glass leaded windows. The rock shattered the stained glass and the thousands of shards that rained down upon the streets. And as the glass shattered, the crowd roared its approval. Seconds later, another one of those soldiers holding one of those torches, or maybe a Molotov cocktail, or other crude explosive device that he quickly lit, followed the path of the first guy, took that flame and bomb and hurled it through the night sky. The flame arced against the darkness of the night sky, and his aim was true, and it usually was. It passed through the shattered window, disappeared behind the wall of the synagogue, followed seconds later by an enormous explosion. And then the crowds cheered and chanted as the flames consumed the synagogue in front of them. And they torched the synagogues of Germany that night, your mother went on. Estimates run that approximately 1,200 synagogues were torched in that one November night. And although your mother could not have known these next facts yet that night, because news didn't travel that fast back then as it does today, investigation would later show that over 8,000 Jewish businesses, 8,000 Jewish businesses, some of them several hundred years old, were trashed, looted, and destroyed that same November night. Two to four hundred German citizens who happened to be Jewish were murdered in the streets of Germany that same November night. And two to four thousand German citizens who happened to be Jewish were arrested under false pretenses, taken away to places that would soon become known as concentration camps, many of them never to be heard from again. Rules. Rules for the occupation. Rules that apply to you. He goes through them one at a time. Rules like curfew, times you'd better be in at night. Long list, severe consequences for any violation. And now you're coming up on one of life's real major transitions, bigger than the one you face this coming year in your lives, your high school graduation. It's a Friday, your high school graduation is two weeks from tomorrow, and you can't wait. You and then you hear a scream back in the square. You don't hear screams very often in your village, so you wonder what's going on. You stop, and you back up, and you look. Well, there's a crowd in front of that bulletin board they put up a year or so ago. We think that's old news. What's going on? Then you notice the woman who screamed. You know her. It's the Jewish grandmother who lives right up the street from you. And now you also notice she hasn't only screamed. She's fainted and is laying on the square near that board. On Saturday, June 17, 1943, the writer of your mind calculates, well, wait a minute. <laughs> that's one week from tomorrow. Your graduation, all that goes with it, is two weeks from tomorrow. This certainly isn't on your time frame. On Saturday, June 17, 1943, all individuals or families of Jewish ancestry or origin, right away you think that's me, living in the region indicated below, you go down to the bottom of the poster, there's a little map on that poster, on that map is your village, they mean you, living in the region indicated below to report to their local train stations at 10 o'clock a.m. with a maximum of two pieces of baggage per family. And here comes the kicker, this is your drop your book bag for resettlement in the east. For resettlement in the east, you're being moved. You hear him shout something in the distance, and then you see him walk very quickly and deliberately towards this guy, and you tell something's gonna happen here because this guy doesn't see him coming. He pushes this guy with such brutal force 
The guy isn't expecting it. He wipes out awkwardly and smacks his head so hard on the stone train platform, you actually hear the dull thud of the skull against the stone from a block and a half away. It's an ugly sound. It makes you shudder. You watch. You see that guy slump over to his back. He doesn't move. You think, my God, he's really got to be hurting. That, his head hit hard. He's probably unconscious. Seconds later from where you're coming, you see an old woman. Her back is to you like this. She stumbles right up to that tall officer to just push that guy. She sticks her fingers up in his face like this, and she starts shouting at him. As soon as you hear the shouts, you recognize the voice. Oh, wait a minute. You think, wait, wait. That's the Jewish grandma who's right up the street from us. Well, now your mind is making connections. Well, wait, if that's her, if that's her, then this guy, that's got to be her son. That's the father of that family. That's one of your best friend's father. You're at their house all the time. He's taught you a lot about things in life. Now you're connected. So you start hurrying to get up there to see if there's something you do to help. Right after this, just a couple of seconds later, the next thing you see is you see this old grandmother's head jerk violently back like that. You see something spray out of both sides of her head. Then as you relive this memory a thousand times since this day, you relive it in slow motion. In slow motion, you see this old grandmother's arm slowly come up like this. And for a few seconds, you think the old lady's going to fly. She doesn't fly. She topples heavily backwards on the platform, and she doesn't move. Every one of these SS guards assigned to this Zonda Einheit, the special detail, wore a leather harness around his waist. And that harness was used to hold a heavy truncheon, a club right here at the center of their back. 